Dang it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> God, I have to stop. It's because I never unplugged the mic now. That's what's going on. I am so sorry. Okay, let's start from scratch. We will start over. Pretend that none of that happened. Pretend that the first three minutes did not exist. And now I am here. So good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Sorry about that. Um, this, this has been the course of my week. I was actually in the process of telling you what a wretched week I was having um, when I suddenly saw everybody going, oh my God, there's no sound. Um, the problem with this is that um, after changing it around to fix the sounds problems or you know what seemed to fix the sound problems, um, I wound up with a, a microphone permanently hooked into the system. Um, for various reasons I won't bore you with. And that's all well and good, except I can't have it on all the time. So I keep turning it off, you know, except during the couple of hours each week when I'm using it, either with you guys or doing Zoom meetings or whatever. And I always forget to turn it back on again. So sorry about that. Um, the things I was talking about after having said hello is um, talking about the, uh, uh, well, first of all, that I've got the first draft of the Navigator's Children, I came to the end of it, which although it's still not technically finished in the sense that I'm doing a polishing draft um, before anybody else gets to see it. But I, I did get through to the end of it and uh, that in and of itself was a huge relief. Although, it, it, and the lip readers out there already have heard me say this or at least they have read it on my lips. So forgive me for saying it again, you people who can read lips. Um, but the... Uh, Oh God, it's so long. And um, I, I'm just going, oh my Lord, what am I doing? What am I thinking? This was supposed to be the last half of a book that I already thought was gonna be long. And you know, if I had put these two books together, we're talking 2,000, 2,100 pages in manuscript, which is like 500 pages longer than uh, To Green Angel Tower. Just crazy, crazy, oh God. Um, anyway. But as it is, it's like 1,200 plus, but I'm gonna see if I can knock that down a little bit during the polish draft. I'm sure there's all kinds of unnecessary verbiage. Um, anyway, but yeah, and then the other thing I was talking about, so that's the good news from the week. The bad news from the week is just everything falling apart out here in the wilderness. We live in the hills, and as a result, um, we have a slightly different setup than a lot of people do. We lose power a lot, unfortunately, because we're surrounded by trees. So almost any time we got a real heavy rain, somewhere between us and electricity, a tree will fall over and take out our lines. This is a price that you pay for living surrounded by trees. And I, it's never been bad enough that I've wanted to give it up. But so in the middle of the week this week, we lost the power just gone, gone for half a day, which is not the worst it's ever been. Anyway, right after we got it back on, um, which of course means, you know, we, the other thing too is because we're in the hills, there's no uh, signal, there's no phone signal. So the only way that we, um, that we uh, managed to, to do it is our Wi-Fi off of our, you know, home internet. Um, but when the power goes out, we don't have that either. So we don't have phone service. We don't have anything when the power goes off. No lights, no heat, no nothing. So we got that turned back on finally. Um, and it was the whole town. It wasn't just, for, if for once, it wasn't just a tree fell down and so our street and a couple of other streets were out. It was like the whole town was out. I still don't know what happened. But very soon after that came, that came back on, then we lost our water. And that has now been off for two and a half days. And uh, we don't know why. This is the story I was telling when I suddenly realized that everybody was saying, there's no sound. And I realized what I'd done again. Um, but so we've had no water for two and a half days. And, you know, that means literally no water. That doesn't, and that's, so that's not just the sinks. That's the toilets and everything, you know. So, uh and, and people keep coming out to the house. You know, we've been calling all these people and they keep coming out and they'll like, oh, I think it's probably this, but I don't have the equipment to fix that. And then the next person comes out and goes, no, it couldn't be that. I think it must be this. Oh, it's the pump. Oh, it's your, you know. So we finally broke down and said, well, we haven't been able to get this solved. Let's 
have them somebody bring in water you know i mean you pay like 400 bucks or something and they come and they they put water in your re reserve tank because we have a reservoir tank that the water is pumped into it by the well and it fills up and then you've got water even when your pump goes out but of course you don't notice the pump's gone out until the reservoir tank also is empty and then you've got nothing so we had somebody come out and put many hundreds of gallons into our reserve tank and then that didn't work either so we had more people out today and and i spent all day standing in the pouring rain with these people from various well and pump services trying to figure out what was going on with no success um so we still have no water so we the the two of the young people and i went out tonight and bought a metric buttload of of water in bottles you know in in jugs and that's what we're using for everything that and and then i also was it was raining hard so i put out a bunch of pots and things to collect water uh which i figured you know well we're not going to drink that because it's drizzling off the roof but at least it's water that we can throw into the toilet tanks or something so that's what life has been like around here no power no water and uh me slowly losing my mind uh deb is over with my dad so fortunately she's missing the worst of it tonight um and uh it's okay we're, we're getting it dealt with one way or the other as i said we got a whole lot of jugs of water <laughs> so but and and it doesn't prevent me from you know since the power's on it doesn't prevent me from doing this so here i am and there you are and that's how it's all going to be tonight so anyway i am going to um say hello to everybody and then i'm gonna start reading because why not you know why not anyway so here we, okay i'm gonna skip over the parts of all the people well, i'll just say hello to people if because even if they were just checking in to say there's no sound they're still saying i'm here so i appreciate the gesture um saying that they are there obviously so anyway so chris Hello, Chris. Good to see you. Becky. Hello. Hello. Anamika. Yes. A pleasure. Jeremy. Jeremy's brother, Jonathan, says a game of Dragon Bone Charades. Ah, okay. Mark Redman laughs. Vouter says, well, it certainly looked interesting. Sandra says, trying to read the lips. There have been some anyways. Yeah, there were a lot of anyways. It's a word I use way too frequently. Not in my writing so much, obviously, because it's very colloquial. But uh, I use it when I'm talking all the time, uh, to the point where I make fun of myself about it sometimes. Um, so anyway, there's Jeremy again saying, Brave the Rain to see opening night of TheaterWorks' Little Shop of Horrors at Lucy Stern. Oh, I hope they'll be doing that till Christmas, because um, daughter Devin uh, starred as, uh, what is her name? The character's name, the, the one that Ellen Green played in the film version with Rick Moranis and all those folks. Um, I, I remember the man as Seymour, but I can't remember offhand what Audrey, of course, cause then the plant is Audrey too. Anyway, our daughter played Audrey and I have to say did very, very well, did brilliantly. Um, so she'd love to see that. I think, see the production. Suzanne, hello. Suzanne says, it's amazing you're still reading to us since March of 2020. It's amazing to me that I'm still here, period. <laughs> it's been a rough few years. Um, okay. So Becky says, leave it long. Actually make it longer. Well, I, there, there is a limit to binding technology, which is what happened with To Green Angel Tower. That's why To Green Angel Tower came out both in America and in um uh england as you know in both both versions um came out as as a double paperback as two paperbacks um because there was no way to to put it in a single volume in paperback and they even showed it to me what it would look like and you know took the book and then opened it up and the whole middle fell out of it so anyway um so we'll see Becky, but I mean, it, it would not hurt for me to trim it. And, and, you know, every single word I, I write is not solid gold. I mean, they're definitely, especially because I write fast, I'm a fast writer. And so quite frequently I will go back in terms of polishing things up and look at it and realize I did not need to describe every single action in that bit or, 
you know, I kind of said the same thing three different ways in three different paragraphs. You know, I don't really need all of that. So I, I don't worry. I'm, I'm not planning to chop out any major plot lines or any major characters, but I am going to try and make it smoother. And, and that's usually the way my books are by the time you see them. I've already gone through and fixed those run-on sentences or clumsy bits, or at least I've tried to, when I noticed that they were run-on or clumsy. Anyway, uh, Andre, hello. Good to see you. Monica, a pleasure. So will there be a Silmarillion edition of everything you take out? Um, I do try to hang on to the bits that get cut. And uh, I... I Deb used to always say like, oh, don't, don't get rid of those. Give them to me. But she's never done anything with them yet. But I do hang on to them. So, you know, who knows? I don't think there'll be a Silmarillion. That, but it basically will be. Or, these are all the plot lines that Tad threw out after trying them and said, no, this isn't going to work. And then found some other way to do it instead. I've got a lot of those. Some of them are pretty interesting. Um, you know, they're like, I could see some way up the line where some people would enjoy looking at them and going, oh, Really? He was going to have that happen to them? Oh, that's, yeah. I'll give you an example, actually, which shows you how, how what a dim bulb I can be sometimes, which is that there was going to be a zombie dragon in the last volume um, until I realized that that had already happened in Game of Thrones. And because I didn't happen to have seen that part of Game of Thrones, um, I didn't, it didn't occur to me. I just was going, oh yeah, cool, that'll work. And then I found out <laughs> and realized, oh, that's all I need is to have everybody go like, he totally copped that from Game of Thrones. So that, that's gone. And, but I actually had like chunks and chunks of it in the, the, when I was first writing the first draft. And, and so those are all now completely pointless. Um, so someday I may find a way to share them with you. Um, okay, so Monica, that's Monica, hello. Wouter, hello. No water is definitely Biden's fault. I blame society. Uh, Cliff, hello. <laughs> hope you're well. Um, I, I do, I hope you're well too. Sorry to hear about the power and water was. Ah, we'll be okay. That's, you know, this is the what you sign up for basically when you decide you want to live up in the hills because it's pretty and it's quiet and it's surrounded by nature. So, you know, we put up with the occasional things. If we really wanted to, we would have probably popped for a big generator or something. But, you know, most of the time, it's only a couple of times a year that we lose power, maybe two, three, four max. Um, it's only when it's a really long one that it's particularly upsetting. Um, anyway, Cliff says this evening sang in another choral concert. Excellent. This time a holiday concert um at, with the nova vista symphony orchestra excellent excellent i'm glad to hear it sounds like a very good use of your time Kristen, hello <coughs> excuse me hello good to see you suzanne very sensibly suggests yes generator and to dig a well no we have a well <laughs> we don't need another well because the whole thing about a well is the water is down in the ground and you have to get the water up to where the people live and we have the water we have the well it's getting it there and at the moment we have these very old pumps which we're probably going to have to replace but we still don't know if that's the problem anyway um sherry hello good morning good to see you sarah hello good to see you isaac a pleasure as always very good chilly more very chilly good morning from the inner mountain west Lost water to the whole apartment, then heat to the third floor. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, it's no fun. Uh, more people talking about various things. Let me see if anybody else checked in that I haven't said hello to yet. Um, that's back in the beginning there. Isaac, Monica, Monica, Monica. Also, okay. And I think that's everybody that I've noticed so far. So anyway, I think that's it. And I'm going to jump in and start reading. I don't think there's anything much. As Thank you for the kind words. We will survive. As I said, you know, this is a choice that we made. We are surrounded by redwoods and oak trees and bay trees and all kinds of beautiful trees. We have um, a lot of space around our house. 
we have to like find a place before we could, you know, we have to like walk around until we can actually find a place where we can sort of vaguely see one of our neighbors. Um, you know, that was very much a choice that we made. We saw the house and instantly said, this is a crazy house. This is perfect for us because that's the kind of family that we are and that's the kind of house we like. Um, it's an octagon, you know, so it's a, it's a strange house in a number of ways. So we made the choice. It's, nobody is to blame for this, um, except maybe Joe Biden. No, it, nobody is to blame for this except it's our choice. And, you know, every now and then stuff goes wrong. You know, I mean, this is what happens. When I lived in my, our last house, we also had things like that because the, you know, like here, we had a, a road that was not, owned by the county but was owned by the people who lived on it and you know the same thing we've got here it's it's all this weird you know stuff that's been grandfathered in from when these places were first settled but we love it we're only like two and a half miles away from the nearest 24-hour quickie mart place you know and and um you know we're 10 minutes from downtown santa cruz and you know, it, it's all good. And every now and then we lose power and every now and then we lose water or every now and then the septic system backs up. But it's part of the price that we pay for our peace and solitude and uh, and the critters, you know. So we've got deer and rabbits and wild turkeys and all this coyotes and bobcats and squirrels and mice and you know we got everything living here on our property with us and bugs and we we decommissioned our swimming pool and kind of turned it into an ongoing sex pond for frogs <laughs> and uh so you know it's we're happy here we're happy you know we just hope we can make things work and stay here and every now and then we're gonna lose power or we're gonna lose water anyway okay so enough about me miserating about my my tragic situation, which isn't really that tragic. Although it, there are times when <laughs> going 48 hours, like having to drive somewhere else to find a bathroom is not much fun. Um, all right. So where were we? Okay. So we are at the meeting in Naglamond with Joshua and all of his invitees. And in the middle of this conversation that they're all having about, you know, well, are you going to fight against your brother, the king? You know, we need to know what you're going to do, the, the various members of this collection of peoples, because um, none of them are very happy with King Elias. And Jaza was saying, well, I'm trying to figure this out. You know, yes, I'm I'm fighting back against him. I, he's, he's kind of flipped out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then this guy Yarnauga has shown up, and Yarnauga is a uh, crazy-looking uh, Rimmersman from the far, far north, um, the farthest part of Rimmersgard before you reach the land of the Norns. And he, as we also, I think we found out in the last one, he is uh, also a uh, member of the League of the Scroll, but I'm not sure if that's been... Yeah, I think Binnebeck already said something about it to him um, because Binnebeck's master was also a member of the League of the Scroll. Anyway, so Yarnauga has started to tell the story of what happened to Inaluki, who is the author, says, um, says Yarnauga, of all the things that are going on, including the king. So Inaluki, this one-time Sithi, who is now something else entirely, um, is behind all of this. So he's telling the story. Um, so this is Yarnauga talking in Naglamond in front of a bunch of people, including Simon and Binnebeck and Joshua and others. Thus Inaluki, despite the great deed of slaying Hidohebi, became his father's heir under the shadow of Hakachi's fall. Blaming himself, perhaps, he spent long years in the pursuit of knowledge that likely should have been barred to man and city alike. At first he may have thought that he could make his brother well, bring him back from the uncharted west, but as with all such quests, soon the search became its own reason and reward, and Inaluki, 
he whose beauty had once been the silent music of the palace of Aswa, became more and more a stranger to his people, a searcher in dark places. So it was that when the men of the north rose up, pillaging and slaying, to encircle Aswa at last in a ring of poisonous iron, Ineluki was the one who set his mind to defeating the trap. In the deep caverns below Aswa, lit by cunning mirrors, grew the Witchwood Gardens, the place where the city tended the trees whose strange wood they used as the southern men used bronze and as the northerners used iron. The Witchwood trees, whose roots some say reached down into the very center of the earth, were tended by gardeners as sacred as priests. Every day they spoke the old spells and performed the unchanging rituals that made the Witchwood thrive. As the king and his court in the palace above sank more and more into despair and forgetfulness. But in a Luki, had not forgotten the gardens, nor had he forgotten the dark books he had read and the shadowy paths he had walked in search of wisdom. In his chambers, where none of the others came any more, he began a task that he thought would be the saving of Aswa and the city. Somehow, causing himself great pain, he procured black iron, which he gave to the witchwood trees as a monk waters his vines. Many of the trees, no less sensitive than the city themselves, sickened and died, but at least one survived. Ineluki wove this tree round with spells, with words older perhaps than the city, and charms that reached down farther even than the witchwood's roots. The tree grew strong again, and this time poisonous iron ran through it like blood. The caretakers of the sacred garden, seeing their charges blighted, fled. They told the Unigato, the king, and he was concerned, but seeing as he did the end of all things, would not stop his son. What use was Witchwood now with bright-eyed men all around and deadly iron in their hands? The growing of the trees sickened in Aluki, even as it did the gardens themselves, but his will was stronger than any illness. He persevered until at last it was time to reap the sought-for harvest. He took his dreadful planting, the Witchwood, all shot through with baleful iron, and went up into the forges of Aswa. Haggard, sick to madness, yet full of grim resolve, he watched the master smiths of Aswa flee before him and did not care. By himself, he heated the forge fires hotter than they had ever been. Alone, he chanted the words of making, all the while wielding the hammer that shapes, which none but the high smith had ever held before. Alone in the red-lit depths of the forge, he made a sword, a terrible grey sword whose very substance seemed to breathe dismay. Such hideous, unholy magics did Inaluki call up during its forging that the very air of Aswa seemed to crackle with heat, and the walls swayed as though struck by giant fists. He took the new forged sword then into his father's great hall, thinking to show his people the thing that would save them. Instead, so terrible was his aspect and so distressing was the grey sword, shining with an almost unbearable light, that the city ran in horror from the hall, leaving only Ineluki and his father Iunigato. In the deepening hush that surrounded Yarnauga's words, a quiet so profound that even the fire seemed to have stopped sputtering, as though it too held its breath, Simon felt the hairs on his neck and arms stand upright, 
and a strange dizziness creep through him. A sword, a gray sword. I can see it so clearly. What does it mean? Where does the thought stick in my head? He scratched hard at his scalp with both hands, as though in his pain he might shake the answer loose. When the Earl King at last saw what his son had made, he must have felt his heart turn to ice in his chest, for the blade Ineluki held was no mere weapon, but a blasphemy against the earth that had yielded both iron and witchwood. It was a hole in the tapestry of creation, and life leaked away through it. Such a thing should not be, Iunigato told his son. Better that we should go into the forgetful void. Better that the mortals gnaw on our bones. Better even that we had never lived at all than such a thing should ever be made, let alone used. But Ineluki was maddened with the power of the thing and horribly tangled in the spells that created it. It is the one weapon that will save us, he told his father. Otherwise, these creatures, these insects, will swarm over the face of the land, destroying as they go, obliterating beauty they cannot even see or comprehend. It is worth any price to prevent that. No, said the Unigato, no, some prices are too great. Look at you. Even now it has worn your mind and heart away. I am your king, as well as your sire, and I command you to destroy it before it devours you utterly. But to hear his father demand such a thing, the unmaking of what he had nearly died of forging, and only done, as he thought, to save his people from final darkness, drove Inaluki past all caring. In that moment he lifted the sword and struck his father down, killing the king of the city. Never before had such a thing been done. And when Inaluki saw a Unigato lying before him, he wept and wept, not only for his father, but also for himself and his people. At last he lifted the gray sword up before his eyes. From sorrow have you come, he said, and sorrow you have brought with you. Sorrow shall be your name. Thus he named the blade Chingizu, which is the word in Sithi tongue. Sorrow. A sword named Sorrow. Simon heard it in his mind as an echo, bouncing back and forth through his thoughts, until it seemed it would drown out Yarnauga's words, the storm outside, everything. Why did it sound so terribly familiar? Sorrow, Jingizu, sorrow. But the story does not end there, the northerner said, his voice gaining strength even as its spell flung a pall of unease over the listening company. Ineluki, more maddened than ever by what he had done, nevertheless took up his father's crown of white birchwood and proclaimed himself king. So, stunned were his family and folk by the murder that they had no stomach to resist him. Some actually welcomed the change in secret, Five in particular, who, like in the Luki, had been angered by the idea of passive surrender to the surrounding mortals. In the Luki, with sorrow in his hand, was a force unbridled. With his five servants, whom the terrified and superstitious northerners named the Red Hand for their number in fire colored cloaks, In the Luki took the battle outside the walls of Azua for the first time in almost three years of siege. Only the sheer numbers, the iron-wielding thousands of Fingil's horde, prevented the night terror that Ineluki had become from breaking the siege. 
as it was if the other city had rallied behind them it could be that city kings would still walk the battlements of the Ehud. but Ineluki's people had no will left to fight frightened of their new king horrified by his murder of Unigato they instead took advantage of the mayhem caused by Ineluki and his red hand to flee Aswa led by Amrasu, the queen, and Shimalnari, son of Ineluki's dragon-doomed brother, Hakatri. They escaped into the dark but protective ways of Aldhart forest, hiding from the blood-mad mortals and their own king. Thus it was that Ineluki found himself left with little more than his five warriors in the glittering skeleton of Aswa. Even his powerful magics had proved too little at the end to withstand the sheer numbers of Fingil's army. The northern shamans spoke their weirds and the last protective magics fell away from the, from the age-old walls. With pitch and straw and torches, the Rimmersmen set the delicate buildings to burning. As the smoke and licking flames rose, the northerners routed out the last of the city, those who had been too weak or too timid to flee or who had felt too much loyalty to their immemorial home. In those fires, Fingil's Rimmer's men did terrible deeds. The remaining city had little strength left to resist. Their world had come to an end. The cruel murders the heartless tortures and the ravishings of unresisting victims, the laughing destruction of a thousand exquisite and irreplaceable things. With all these, Fingil Red Hand's army put his crimson stamp on our history and left a stain that can never be removed. Doubtless, those who had fled to the forest heard the screams and shuddered and wept to their ancestors for justice. In this last most fatal hour, Ineluki took his red hand and climbed to the summit of the tallest tower. He had decided, it seems clear, that what the city could no longer inhabit would never be the home of men. That day, he spoke words more terrible than any he had spoken before, more baleful by far than even those which had helped bind the substance of sorrow. As his voice boomed out above the conflagration, Rimmersmen fell screaming in the courtyard, faces blackening and with blood running from their eyes and ears. The chanting rose to an intolerable pitch, and then became a vast scream of agony. A huge flash of light turned the sky white, followed a moment later by a darkness so complete that even Fingil, in his tent a mile away, thought he had been struck blind. But, in some way, Ineluki had failed. Azua still stood and still burned, although now, Many of Fingil's army lay wailing and dying on the ground at the tower's base. In the tower top itself, strangely untouched by smoke or flame, the wind sifted six piles of grey ash, scattering them slowly across the floor. Sorrow. Simon's head was whirling and he had difficulty drawing breath. The torchlight seemed to be flickering wildly. The hillside. I heard the wagon wheels. They brought sorrow. I, I remember it was like the devil in a box. The heart of all sorrow. So Ineluki died. One of Fingil's lieutenants, as he breathed his last breath, Minutes later, swore that he had seen a great form billowing out of the tower, crimson as coals in a fire, writhing like smoke, grasping at the sky. 
like a huge red hand. No! Simon shouted, leaping up. A hand reached up to restrain him, then another, but he shook them off as though they were cobwebs. They brought the gray sword, a horrible sword, and, and then I saw him. I saw Inaluki. He was... He was... The room was wobbling back and forth and staring faces. His Grimner, Binibic, the old man Yarnauga, loomed up before him like fish leaping in a pond. He wanted to say more, to tell them all about the hillside and the white demons, but a black curtain was being pulled before his eyes and something was roaring in his ears. Simon ran in dark places, and his only companions were words in the emptiness. Moon calf, come to us. There is a place here prepared for you. A boy, a mortal child. What did it see? What did it see? Freeze his eyes and carry him down into shade. Cover him with clinging, stinging frost. A shape loomed before him, an antler-headed shadow, massive as a hill. It wore a crown of pale stones, and its eyes were red fires. Red was its hand, too, and when it clutched and lifted him, the fingers burned like fiery brands. White, flaces, white faces flickered up all around, wavering in the darkness like candle flames. The wheel is turning, mortal, turning, turning. Who are you to stop it? A fly he is, a little fly. The crimson fingers squeezed, and the fiery eyes glowed with dark and infinite humor. Simon screamed and screamed, but was answered only by pitiless laughter. He awoke from a strange swirl of chanting voices and clutching hands to find his dream mirrored in the circle of faces that bent over him, pale in the torchlight as a fairy ring of mushrooms. Beyond the blurry faces, the wall seemed lined with points of glinting light mounting up into the darkness above. Hang on, I'm just checking something here. He's waking up, a voice said. Say, wait, hang on. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, sorry, I missed a sentence. To find his dream mirrored in the circle of faces that bent over him, pale in the torchlight as a fairy ring of mushrooms. Beyond the blurry faces, the walls seemed lined with points of glinting light mounting up into the darkness above. He's waking up, a voice said, and suddenly the glimmering points came clear as rows of pots hanging on racks. He was lying on the floor of a pantry. Doesn't look good, said a deep voice nervously. I'd best get him some more water. I I'm sure he'll be fine if you want to go back inside, the first voice replied, and Simon felt himself squinting and goggling until the face that went with it was no longer a blur. It was Maria. No, it was Miriamel kneeling beside him. He couldn't help noticing that the hem of her dress lay crumpled beneath her on the dirty stone floor. No, uh, no, the other said. Duke is Grimner, pulling nervously at his beard. What happened? Had he fallen and struck his head? He reached up to feel gingerly around, but the soreness was general, and there was no lump. Keeled over, you did, boy, his Grimner grunted, shouting about, about things you saw. I carried you out here. Fair busted a gut doing it, too. And then stood there staring at you lying on the floor, said Miriam Al, her voice stern. It's a good thing I was coming in. She looked up at the Rimmersman. You fight in battles, don't you? What do you do when somebody's wounded? Stare at them? That's different, the Duke said defensively. Bandage them if they're bleeding. Carry them back on their shields if they're dead. Well, that's clever, Miriam L. snapped, but Simon saw a secret smile tug at her lips. And if they're not bleeding or dead, I suppose you just step over them? Never mind. 
as Grimner closed his mouth and tugged at his beard. The princess continued to wipe Simon's forehead with her dampened handkerchief. He couldn't imagine what good it was doing, but for the moment he was content to just lie back and be tended to. He knew that soon enough he would have to explain himself to somebody. I, I knew I recognized you, boy, as Grimner said at last. You were the lad at St. Hodron's, am I right? And that troll, I thought I saw. The pantry door opened wider. Ah, Simon, I hope you are feeling more of yourself now. Pinnebeck, Simon said, straining to sit up. Miriamel gently but firmly leaned on his chest, forcing him back down. I did see it. I did. That was what I couldn't remember. The hillside and the fire and... and... I know, friend Simon. I was understanding many things when you stood up. Not all things, however. There is still much unexplained in this riddle. They must think I'm a madman. Simon groaned, pushing the princess's hand away, but nevertheless enjoying the moment of contact. What was she thinking? Now she was looking at him like a grown girl looked at a troublesome younger brother. Damn girls and women both. No, Simon, Binnebeck said, crouching down beside Miriamel to look him over carefully. I have been telling many stories, our adventuring together not least among them. Yarnauga has confirmed much that my master was hinting at. He also received one of Morgenis's last messages. No, you are not thought mad, although I think still many are doubting the real danger. Baron de Vassalis especially, I am thinking. Oof, as Grimner scuffed a boot on the floor. If the lads hail, I think I'd better go back in. Simon, was it? Yes, well, you and I will talk more. The Duke maneuvered his considerable bulk out of the narrow pantry and clumped off down the hall. And I will be going in too, Miriamel said, briskly chasing the worst of the dust from her dress. There are things that should not be decided before I have been heard, whatever my uncle thinks. Simon wanted to thank her, but could think of nothing to say while lying on his back that would not make him feel more ridiculous than he presently did. By the time he decided to throw over his pride, the princess had gone in a swirl of silks. "'And if you are recovered to sufficiency, Simon,' Binnebeck said, extending a small blunt hand, "'then there are things we must hear in the council hall, for I am thinking... Naglement has never seen a ride quite the like of this one. First of all, young one, Yarnauga said, while I believe all that you have told us, you must know that it was not in Aluki you saw on that hillside. The fires had burned down to dreaming coals, but not a soul had left the hall. If you had seen the Storm King, in the form he must now wear, it would have left you a blasted, mindless shell lying beside the anger stones. No, what you saw, beside the pale Norns and Elias and his liegemen, was one of the Red Hand. Even so, it seems miraculous to me that you came away from such a night vision, whole in heart and mind. But, but... As he began to remember what the old man had been saying just before the wall of forgetfulness had crumbled, spilling the memories of that horrible night, stoning night, the doctor had called it, Simon was again puzzled and confused. But I thought you said Inaluki and his red hand were dead. Dead, yes. Their earthly forms burnt away utterly in the last scorching moments. But something survived. There was something or someone that was able to recreate the sword sorrow. Somehow, and it did not need your experience, tell me, for this is indeed why the League of the Book was made, 
Inaluki and his red hand survived. As living dreams, or thoughts perhaps, shades held together only by hate, and by the terrible runes of Inaluki's last casting. But somehow the darkness that was Inaluki's mind at the very ending did not die. King Ailstan Fiskern came three centuries later to the Hayholt, the castle that stood upon the bones of Azwa. Ailstan was wise and a seeker after knowledge, and he found things in the ruins beneath the Hayholt that made him aware that Inaluki had not been completely unmade. He formed the League, of which I am a member, and we are dwindling fast now with the loss of Morgenes and Ukekuk, so that old knowledge would not be lost. Not only knowledge of the city's dark lord, but other things too, for those were evil times in the north of Ostenard. Over the years it was discovered, or rather guessed at, that somehow Ineluki, or his spirit, or shade, or living will, had become manifest again among the only ones who might welcome him. The Norns, Binnebeck said, as if suddenly a bank of fog had been swept away before him. The Norns, Yarnauga agreed. I doubt that at first even the white foxes knew what he had become. But soon his influence in Sturmspike was doubtless too great for anyone to say him nay. His red hand, too, has come back with him, although in no form seen before on this earth. And we had thought that the Lokin, worshipped by the Black Rimmersmen, was only our own fire god from heathen days, said his Grimner, wondering. If I had known how far they had strayed from the path of light, he brushed his fingers against the tree that hung upon his neck. You sirens, he breathed softly. Prince Joshua, who had been listening silently for a long while, leaned forward. But why, if it is indeed this demon out of the past who is our truest enemy, does he not show himself? Why does he play at cat's paw with my brother Elias? Now we are coming to the place where my long years of study atop Tungledir cannot be helpful, Yarnauga shrugged. I watched, and I listened, and I watched, for that is what I was there to do. But what goes on in the mind of such a being as the Storm King is more than I can guess at. Ethelfirth of Tinset stood and cleared his throat. Joswin nodded for him to speak. If all this is true, and my head is a swimming with it, I tell you, then maybe I can guess it at last. He looked around as though expecting to be shouted down for his presumptuousness, but seeing in the faces around him only worry and confusion, he cleared his throat again and went on. The Rimmersman, he tilted his head toward old Yarnauga, said that it was our own Ailstan Feskern who was first noticing that the Storm King had come back. That was three hundred years after Fingil took the Hayhold, or whatever was its name then. It's been nigh two hundred years since. It sounds to me as though this demon, I suppose, has taken a long time to get strong again. Now, he continued, we all know we men that have held land in the midst of greedy neighbors. He snuck a sly look over at Ordmayer, but the fat baron had gone quite pale some time before and seemed insensible to innuendo. Uh, the best way to keep yourself safe and purchase yourself time to grow strong is to have your neighbors fight each other. Seems to me that's what's going on here. This Rimmersgard demon gives Elias a present, then gets him a-fighting with his barons and dukes and such. Ethelfirth looked around, hitched his tunic, and sat down. It's not a Rimmersgard demon, Einskaldir growled. We're shriven Idenite men. 
Josue ignored the northerner's comment. There is truth to what you say, Lord Ethelfirth, but I think those who know Elias will agree that he also has designs of his own. He didn't need any Sithy demon to steal my land, his Grimner said bitterly. Nevertheless, Joshua continued, I find Yarnauga and Binibik of Ikanuk and young Simon, who was Dr. Morganis's apprentice, all too uncomfortably trustworthy. I wish I could say I did not believe these tales. I am not sure yet what I believe, but neither can I discount them. He turned to Yarnauga again, who was prodding at the nearest fire with an iron poker. If these dire warnings you bring are true, then tell me one thing. What does Inaluki want? The old man stared into the fire, then poked it again vigorously. As I said, Prince Joshua, my task was to be the League's eyes. Both Morgenes and young Binabik's master knew more than I of what might lurk in the mind of the master of Stormspike. He raised a hand as if to ward off more questions. If I had to guess, it would be to say this. Think of the hatred that kept Ineluki alive in the void, that brought him back from the fires of his own death. What Ineluki wants, then? Joshua's voice fell heavily in the dark, breathing hall. Is revenge. Yarnaga only stared into the embers. There is much to think on, the master of Naglaman said, and no decisions to be lightly made. He stood up, tall and pale, slender face a mask before his hidden thoughts. We shall return here tomorrow, sunset. He went out with a grey-cloaked guard on either side. In the hall, men turned to look at each other, then rose, clustering in small, silent groups. Simon saw Miriamel, who had never had her chance to speak, go out between Einskalder and the limping Duke is Grimner. "'Come, Simon,' Benedict said, tugging at his sleeve. "'I think I will be letting Kantaka run. Now the rains have gentled some.' Of such things we must take advantage. At this point I still have not been robbed of my liking for thinking, as I walk with wind in my face. And there is much that I should be thinking. Binnebeck, Simon said at last, the shocking, wearying day sitting heavily upon him. Do you remember the dream I had, we all had, in Jaloy's house? Storm Spike, and that book. Yes, said the little man gravely. That is one of the things I am worrying with. The words, the words you saw, they catch at me. I am fearing there is a dreadfully important riddle in them. Do, do swar, Simon struggled with his muddled, muddied, muddled memories. Do, do Svardenverd. It was, Binnebeck sighed, the weird of the swords. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Can I read a bit further? Yeah, I can read a bit further. <clears throat> the hot air beat painfully on Priorates' hairless and unprotected face, but he would allow no discomfort to show on his features. As he strode across the foundry floor, robes flapping, he was gratified to see the workmen themselves, masked and heavily cloaked, stare and flinch at his passing. Buoyant in the pulsing forge light, he chuckled as he briefly fancied himself an arch demon striding the tiles of hell, petty under devils scattering before him. A moment later, the mood fell away, and he scowled. Something had happened to that little wretch of a wizard's boy. Pyrates knew it. He had felt it as clearly as if someone had jabbed him with some sharp thing. There was some strange, tenuous bond still between them from stoning night. It bit at him and gnawed at his concentration. That night's business had been too important, too dangerous to bear any kind of interference. 
Now, the boy was thinking of that night again, probably telling all he knew to King Luth or Joshua or someone. Something serious needed to be done about that nasty, prying boy. He stopped before the great crucible and drew himself up, arms folded upon his chest. He stood that way for no little while, already angry, growing angrier at the weight. Sorry, I just lost my place here. Already angry, growing angrier at the weight. At last, one of the foundry men hurried up and clumsily bent a thick, knee, thick breeched knee before him. How can we serve you, Master Prorates? The man said, voice muffled by the damp cloth wrapped across his lower face. The priest stared silently long enough to change the man's partially revealed expression from discomfort to real fear. Where is your overseer? He hissed. There, father. The man pointed to one of the dark openings in the foundry cavern wall. One of the crank wheels be gone on the winch, your eminence. Which was gratuitous, since he was still officially no more than a priest. But the sound of it was not inharmonious. Well? Pyrades asked. The man did not respond, and Pyrades kicked him hard on his leather-clad shin. Get him, then, he shrilled. With a head-wagging bow, the man limped off, moving like a toddling child in the padded clothes. Pyrates was aware of the beads of sweat forming on his brow, and of the furnace-spewed air that seemed to bake his lungs from the inside. But nevertheless, a brief grin stretched his spare features. He had felt worse things. God, or whoever, knew he had faced worse. At last the overseer came, huge and deliberate, his height, when he finally shambled to a halt and stood looming over Priorities, was almost enough in itself to be regarded as an insult. I suppose you know why I've come, the priest said, black eyes glittering, mouth taut with displeasure. About the engines, the other replied, voice quiet but childishly petulant. Yes, about the siege engines, Priorities snapped. Take off that damn mask, Inch, so I can see you when I speak to you. The overseer reached up a bristle-haired paw and peeled back the cloth. His ruined face, rippled with bar burn scars around the empty right eye socket, reinforced the priest's sensation that he stood in one of the, an one of the ante-rooms of the great inferno. The engines are not finished, Inch said stubbornly. Lost three men. When the big one collapsed, draws day last. Slow going. I know they're not finished. Get more men. Edan knows there are enough slagging about the hayhold. We put some of the nobles to work. Let them get a few blisters on their fine hands. But the king wants them finished. Now. He's going into the field in ten days. Ten days, damn you. Inch's one eyebrow slowly rose like a drawbridge. Naglemon. He's going to Naglemon, isn't he? There was a hungry light in his eye. That's not for such as you to worry about, you scarred ape, Pyrates said contemptuously. Just have them finished. You know why you were given this loftier place. But we can take it back. Pyrates could feel inches stare on him as he walked away, could feel the man's stone-like presence in the smoky, flickering light. He wondered again whether it had been wise to let the brute live, and if not, whether he should rectify the error. And I'm going to stop there in part because I've been doing Rimaskad voices and my throat, it hurts. It's very painful to talk in Rimaskad. It's cold up there, you know. Anyway, so with that, I say hello to everybody else who showed up that I hadn't had a chance to say hello to yet. So hello, Ilva, darling, and hello, Anna, and hello, Paul, and hello, anybody else that I missed. It was not intentional. Um, 
excuse me, you can see I've got Rimmer's Guard hangover here. Um, ah. So, that's it for tonight. So, thank you for joining me. Thank you for putting up with the small hiccup at the beginning of the broadcast. Um, I will try and remember to turn the mic on before I start next time. Um, meanwhile, all of you take care of yourselves. Take care of your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors. Um, I will be reading again 7 o'clock uh, later today, in fact. Um, but then again, of course, I'll be reading probably almost certainly next week as well at the same time. So if I don't, s don't read for you tomorrow, I will be reading for you next week. So with that, I say once again, thank you for joining me. Great pleasure to share time with you. Hope you all have a great week one way or the other, and I will see you all soon. Peace. Be good. <laughs>